I know most of you are probably very familiar with this character, but for those of you that aren't, this is Mafalda, a little girl invented by the comic genius Kino. Now, this strip was written in the 60s before I was even born, and the world population was around 3 billion people. And Mafalda's thinking ahead to when it will be 7 billion people, and she's feeling pretty depressed about this. Until her friend Philippe comes along. And he says, ah, oh, Mafalda, don't worry. The problem isn't the number of people. What's important is that the percentage of stupid people doesn't increase. <laughs> now, we've already long passed 7 billion people. We're at 7.7 .7 billion people at the moment. And we're on track to 10 billion by 2050. And has the percentage of stupid people increased? Well, I'm not one to comment on stupidity on an individual level, although some world leaders do make me tempted to do so. But it does seem to me that as a species, we humans are doing our best to eliminate ourselves and cause quite a bit of collateral damage along the way. We are uniquely fortunate to live on this beautiful planet, and yet we're killing ourselves through war, poverty, inequality, and increasingly through environmental destruction, particularly catastrophic climate change and biodiversity loss. Animals are disappearing at an alarming rate. We've lost 60% of vertebrates in the last 50 years. 90% of the big fish in the sea have gone. We've fished them out. Insect populations are crashing. Plant species are disappearing before we've even learned about them. We are living through the sixth mass extinction. Now, the planet will survive. It's been here before. But we humans and our way of life may not. We depend on nature for the food we eat, the water we drink, the air that we breathe. Every second breath of oxygen that we take comes from tiny organisms in the ocean. The rest comes from trees and plants, which also soak up carbon from the atmosphere, provide us with building materials, medicines even. Mangroves and marshes protect our coasts and prevent the terrible impacts of floods, of storms, of tidal waves. And every single organism plays its part. Whether that's the charismatic top predators, that we know are at risk, or this strange-looking nudibranch, which you've probably never heard of, which lives in the Azores and eats the deadly Portuguese man-of-war. The cute ones play their part. They make us feel good. But so do the scary ones. They help pollinate our crops, clear up our waste. And then, of course, insects are great, but you need someone to control the population, right? These and all other animals, plants, microbes are really essential for the functioning of the planet. Yet if we don't do something about climate change and habitat loss, we risk losing a million species by the end of the century. Can we really afford to do that? This is my daughter in one of my favorite places on Earth, the Azores. And I owe it to her and to her generation to try to do something about this. And we can do something about this. People depend on nature. People are destroying nature. But we can also protect it. And I'm going to tell you about three people who are doing just that. The first is Matthew Inqua, a ranger in Bia National Park in Ghana. Bia is a biosphere reserve and a really important place, a refuge for plants and animals. Like many rangers around the world, Matthew went out, protected his, his forest that he loved, that he was dedicated to. And I say was, because a little more than a month ago, Matthew was brutally killed by poachers. 
And he's not the only one. Hundreds of rangers around the world have lost their lives over the last years simply for doing their job. We don't hear about it. Matthew's death wasn't even reported in the newspapers in Ghana. I only know about it because his friend Caleb told me. Matthew leaves behind a wife and four children. And I wanted to take this opportunity today to say thank you to Matthew and rangers around the world who are risking their lives, not just for their sake, for their forest, but for ours as well. And what they do really does make a difference. And there is hope. Across Africa, on the other side, is the Gorongosa National Park in Mozambique. Now, the brutal civil war that ravaged the country also had a devastating impact on the park. And whereas it used to teem with wildlife, much of that was wiped out. In 1994, there were only 100 elephants left whereas previously there were thousands. But all was not lost. In 2004, the Gorongosa Restoration Project started. Relocation projects brought back elephants, hippos, wildebeest, and the nature began to rebound. But crucially, they didn't just focus on the wildlife. The community is so important for the future of Gorongosa. And so they built schools, clinics, ecotourism projects, even a sustainable coffee plantation. And in this way, the park is providing livelihoods for hundreds of people, and it's launched the careers of many young Mozambicans, one of whom is Dominique Gonçalves. She's a National Geographic explorer, and she's in charge of the elephant program at Gorongosa. She introduces really innovative methods to prevent human-wildlife conflict. She even stops elephants from going into human villages using bees. And I love the fact that a giant elephant with a pretty thick skin is petrified of bees, right? <laughs> because of her work, the elephants are coming back. There are now more than 500, and the numbers are going up. But again, Dominique doesn't just care about the elephants. She's also working on a project called the Gorongosa Girls Club, which reaches thousands of young girls around the surrounding area, educates them, and prevents early marriage and bad health. Conservation will only work if it goes hand in hand with women's empowerment, poverty alleviation, and education. It has to be people and nature, not either or. Now, Gorongosa shows us that nature is resilient. It can bounce back, but it needs our help. And this is why National Geographic Society, together with the Weiss Foundation and other partners, is launching a campaign to get national governments to commit to protecting 30% of the planet, land and sea, by 2030. Please do support this campaign if you can, the Campaign for Nature. We need to protect nature if we want to protect ourselves. And nature isn't just some far off place, it's here too. And so my third conservation hero is Raquel Gaspar. She works in the Sado Estuary here in Portugal. And her first love was the dolphins of the estuary. She studied them, she gave them names. She even called one shark, Tubarão. And I would not want to be at the beach when Raquel's there shouting, oh, there's Tubarão. <laughs> not, not a good idea. But as she was studying the dolphins, she came to realize that actually, more important to that ecology is something far less iconic, far less well known. And that's seagrass. Seagrass meadows provide homes, shelter, nurseries, food, for a multitude of organisms that the dolphins live on. And yet, very little is known about the seagrass. So Raquel founded an NGO, Ocean Alive, and she works with the local fishing communities. She's built up a group of women who are mapping the seagrass meadows, finding out about the threats to them, including threats due to dredging of the estuary. And crucially, those women are working with their fellow fishermen and women 
to inspire them to protect the seagrasses, which ultimately their livelihoods depend on. She's my local hero. So you've heard about three people who are doing amazing things to protect the natural world. And the question really is, what are you going to do about it? Now, I know you've probably heard all this before. You know there's a problem. You know you should be doing something about it. And I know you probably all try to do your bit. You recycle. You don't use single-use water bottles. I'm the same. I think I'm doing my bit by taking small green steps to a more sustainable life. But I still fly. I bought my flight to come here almost without even thinking about it. And when I did think about it, I realized that my good intentions are not enough. I can't go on taking the small, convenient, easy green steps here whilst ignoring the big changes that I need to make, which will really have an impact. Now, the two biggest contributions to my environmental footprint are flying and eating meat. So, I'm going to try and cut down on flying where I can, and as of a couple of weeks ago, I've given up beef. And this is not going to be easy for me. I like hamburgers, I love steak. My favourite food when I come to Portugal is picanha. <laughs> but I'm going to try. And I'm going to try and cut down on the other types of meat as well. But beef is the one that really has the most impact, both on climate change and deforestation. Just by me not eating beef for a couple of months will compensate for the flight that I took to get here. Some scientists say that the most important thing, the single biggest contribution you could do to reduce your environmental impact is to become vegan. Now, I'm not going to ask all of you to become vegan today. I'm not quite that brave. <laughs> but I am going to ask you to challenge yourselves. Think about your lives. What's the one thing that you could do that would really reduce your environmental impact? Could you give up beef? Could you travel more sustainably, not fly, not go by car, go by train? Could you decide who to vote for, depending on their environmental policies? And think about why you're not doing that. Try to, try to remove those barriers. Try to make a commitment. In fact, I want every single one of you now, today, to make a commitment to do one big thing. And you can do it for your own reasons. Maybe you do it because you love nature and you want to protect it. Maybe you do it because you've seen the devastation that the forest fires had on Portugal. And you know they're only going to get worse with climate change. So you want to protect your friends, your family, your communities. Maybe you do it because you know that being green is really fashionable. There's loads of celebrities getting behind the cause. And you could be a trendsetter ahead of the curve. It really doesn't matter why you do it. It just matters that you do something and you do it now. Because we have no time to waste. And if your choice seems too difficult, think about the million children who went on strike yesterday for climate because they're petrified about the future that we have prepared for them. Think about Raquel and Dominique who've dedicated their lives to protecting nature. And think about Matthew and his family and the sacrifice that they made. And then think about whether your choice is too difficult or not. Thank you.